If we remember the skin, remember it consisted of a dermis, an epidermis, and then the stratum corneum was the outer layer of the epidermis. Okay? We look at the hoof, the dermis is now going to be called the corneum. Okay? The epidermis is going to be the germinal epithelium, and the stratum corneum is what makes up the hoof. Okay? Let's look at the hoof grossly. We're going to have the epidermis here with an underlying dermis. Okay. The junction of the skin and the hoof wall is known as the cornet, sometimes referred to as the coronary band. Then the initial epithelium of the hoof is going to be known as the periopic epithelium. And it's going to give rise to the stratum externum, or periopal, which is a very thin layer over the surface. Okay. Now it's going to have an underlying connective tissue known as the periopic corium. Okay, our next epithelium is going to give rise to the bulk of the hoof wall. This is the coronary epithelium. And as we said, the stratum medium makes up the bulk of the hoof wall. Okay. It has an underlying connective tissue, which guess what it's called? That's right. The coronary corneum. Okay, now running parallel to the third phalanx is going to be the laminar epithelium. This gives rise to another thin layer, the stratum internum. And its underlying connective tissue is, that's right, the laminar corium. Okay, we're also going to have epithelium of the sole with a corium of the sole and an epithelium of the frog with a corium of the frog. Okay. We look at this image here. Here we can see the periopic epithelium. Here we have the coronary epithelium. And down here we can see some laminar epithelium. Now let's do a little close-up at the coronet. So you can see here we've got some hair follicles and so right about here is that junction between the skin and the hoof. So this is going to be our cornet. Okay. So here we have our periopic epithelium giving rise to our stratum externum or periopal. Okay. And then we have periopic corium beneath it. Okay, along here, this is where we find our coronary epithelium. So we see here that the coronary corium has these dermal papillae that extend out. Okay, these are going to be covered by the coronary epithelium. Okay, so coronary epithelium produces our stratum medium, so that's the horny layer, and growth is going to occur in that direction. Here we see a little laminar epithelium, but we're going to come back to that. Okay. Now in this image here, we can see that we have the corium here, and we have the overlying epithelium here. Okay, so from the tips of this, we're going to get this, what's called tubular horn. Okay, so when you look at a hoof wall, you'll notice there are striations on it, and that is due to this tubular horn. And then surrounding that's going to be intertubular horn. Yes. Well, if you ever looked at the hoof wall, you would see striations down through here like this. Those striations are due to the tubular horn. Okay, so, so stratum externum up here, stratum medium here. You can see the dashed line there is just kind of an estimate where the stratum medium ends and the stratum internum begins.
and you'll notice if you look really closely we can see the lamina okay this illustration may help you so here we see the stratum externum stratum medium the more most inner portion is non-pigmented stratum internum so we see the tubular and the intertubular horn so let's look at a histological section here we can see stratum medium stratum externum we're just kind of assuming that's where it's at because you really can't tell the difference here we can see our stratum internum we do a close-up look at these lamellae and we're going to have laminar corium here with our laminar epithelium so our insensitive laminae consists of the stratum internum here and then the laminar corium makes up our sensitive laminae okay I'm going to show you this image here okay so here we can see tubular horn very nicely and then so this is all intertubular horn between and if we look at these laminae closer we have not only primary laminae but we have secondary laminae someone has counted and there's about 600 primary laminae with about a thousand secondary laminae okay so what is the importance of all these laminae? Okay, this is going to be important because it's going to increase surface area for attachment of the hoof to the underlying connective tissue, which is closely adherent to the periosteum of the bone. Okay? So it's important then that the weight of the horse, when that hoof hits the ground, it is transferred to that third phalanx okay and the hoof isn't pushed up the limb in this image here showing our perioplic epithelium making our stratum externum coronary epithelium making our stratum medium notice that the deepest portion of that is non-pigmented then we have our laminar epithelium that makes up our stratum internum notice the direction of growth of that horny layer of the stratum internum comes outward initially but then is redirected downward by the growth of the stratum medium okay so once again here's our white line okay so as I said the white line is important for farriers to avoid driving nails into the sensitive laminae okay so if we drive a nail in here the horn of the sole is softer so there might be a tendency for that nail to hit that wall and redirect upward and we don't want to hit this sensitive laminate here okay so we want to put our nails out through here okay moving from the wall we see the sole so sole fills the ground surface space between the wall and the frog generally that external surface is concave although we see in the larger draft breeds that it's not quite so we find that the keratinized portion of the sole contains more water which makes it a softer substance than the wall itself okay then the frog is a wedge-shaped structure located between the two bars the depression between the two bars are the pericuneal or sometimes called collateral sulci or grooves Okay, so the frog itself consists of two crura and a central sulcus. The central sulcus corresponds to the inner surface with the frog stay or spine. The horny portion of the frog is the softest portion of the hoof containing more water than even the sole. Both the frog and the sole also consist of tubular horn. Okay, so let's now look here where the sole is being formed. So we have corium of the sole, epithelium of the sole. We still have dermal papilla here, so it's still going to be tubular horn. And likewise, if we were to come back over here, we would find 
Corium of the Frog, Epithelium of the Frog, and Horn of the Frog. Okay? We find that on the third phalanx, there is a cartilage plate, which is attached to the palmar surface here. These plates are above the hoof. You can actually palpate those on the heels of your horse. Numerous ligaments, more so than what I've shown here, attach these cartilage to the adjacent structures. These cartilages are important upon concussion, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay, brief the digital cushion. It's a wedge-shaped structure containing fibrous and adipose tissue, occupying the space deep to the frog and between the two ungual cartilages. Caudal portion is partially subcutaneous, underlying the bulbs of the heel here. We see that there's an extensive venous plexus that is present in the corium and the subcutis of the hoof. Okay. Upon concussion, these forces from the sole frog and digital cushion and the outward movement of the ungual cartilages push the blood out of this plexus and up the limb. Okay, it was once thought that this acts as a hydraulic shock absorber, but more recent research in the lab that I worked in discovered that it occurs too rapidly for this to actually occur as a hydraulic shock absorber. Okay, hoof concussion. Okay, some important things to remember about concussion of the hoof. When it occurs, we get transfer of the energy of impact across the laminae to the digit. The quarters in the heels, because we're further back here, the horn that is produced is newer than the horn that is produced at the toe. And because it is newer, it is softer. And so some of this energy is also going to be dissipated by the expansion of the quarters in the heels. Okay, this is why farriers generally will not put nails in the more palmar portions of the hoof. Okay, so that allows expansion of the heels as the foot hits the ground. Also upon concussion we see a lot of energy from the frog dissipated then into the digital cushion. This is important to remember there have been farriers in the past that like to trim that frog up off the ground but it's important to have that frog in contact with the ground for this dissipation of energy of impact. Okay. Also, we have compression of the venous plexus, which we just mentioned, pushes the blood out of the plexus and up the limb. So kind of acting like hearts, helping pump the blood up the limb. So these are some important things to remember that occur during hoof concussion. And that is all.